Welcome back to another episode of the Mile 40 Podcast. I am so thankful for all of you for continuing to tune in. If you haven't already, I'll ask you kindly, please be sure to follow along on your platform of choice. Uh, hit subscribe, drop us a review. It goes a long way in helping us grow the show. Today's guest is Jeff Hancher. Jeff is the founder of Jeff Hancher Enterprises that specializes in business consulting, leadership development, and sales training. Prior to starting his own business, he was a senior leader for a Fortune 500 company. From his humble beginnings, which we're going to dive into, as a truck driver, he was promoted 12 times in his 24-year career. While working in corporate America, Jeff earned numerous awards for his sales and leadership performance. Jeff's also a veteran of the United States Army and the host of the Champion Forum podcast. However, and I'm going to add this in, his favorite titles are that of husband to his wife, Janelle, and dad to his children, Jake and Jacqueline. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. So good to be with you. So good to be with your audience. Um, you're doing an amazing work. You have an amazing story and uh, you're putting it out into the world. So it's folks like you that are the catalyst for change. So I'm honored to be on the show and be with your audience. Thank you. Thank you. And I just realized as I was reviewing your bio, you got four J's in the family. I imagine there was some intention there. Yeah. And the dog was Jasmine. So um, there was some intentionality. My wife comes from all J's. Okay. And uh, as luck would have it, she married a Jeff and the rest is history. So there we go. Uh, is there any crossover between her family and your family in terms of names? Or are all different J's across the board? All different J's across the board. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So, and he, it gets a little cornier even than that. She, when we, uh, when the kids were super little, she would, on Christmas cards, she would write one big J huh. and then EFF. Huh. A-K-E. Talk about, I mean, it gets a little corny. Hopefully she doesn't listen to this show. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Um, Jeff, I just want to say thank you for joining me today. It's a real honor to have you on the show. You came as a recommendation from uh, a good friend of mine uh, who I've met in the professional world and someone who I've worked closely with over the last couple of years and uh, someone who I really trust. And you know, once he saw Mile 40 growing, he said, I have the person for you. And that mm. was you. And mm. you and I got to connect a little bit before we hopped on today. We talked about the premise of the show. Um, and what I love about your story is that it hits on so many of the different points that we really try to touch on at mile 40. Um, and so I want to start off first by giving the listeners a little bit of insight into where things began for you. Tell us about you know the humble beginnings that you referenced in, in your bio. Yeah. Um... You know, there's a lot of stories out there of uh, adversity and challenge. Uh, you have your own story as well. <clears throat> and I obviously uh, have one as well. I've shared it with you. But the essence of it is I grew up with two very, very sick parents uh, in very, very poor health. And um, they got an early start to their marriage. My mom suffered from a disease called lupus. Um, and it, it was the worst, uh, that it could be. There's three types of lupus. She happened to have all three. So it affected organ, skin, neurological issues, uh, multiple surgeries. My dad suffered from chronic osteoarthritis. So it took his ability to really function as a career. And then he had to be a caregiver as well. So multiple surgeries, unfortunately, they both died pretty young. Uh, but childhood was tough because we were a product of the system and you know, had to rely on government assistance to to get to where we wanted to go. And that led to, you know, a lot of uh, tough beginnings, uh, led to some, some drug abuse within my family, um, a lot of bad decisions. Uh, to say that there wasn't a lot of direction would be an understatement. I mean, they're literally fighting for their lives. Mm. So, you know, to instill things into me and my brother, not that we were animals or anything, but they're literally fighting for their life. So me and my brother, we became somewhat dysfunctional as teenagers. We had a ton of freedom. Um, but sure, there were times that both of my parents would be in the hospital for weeks at a time with two teenage boys left at home. So you can imagine mm. frat house, 10X. Yeah. And we got into a lot of trouble, brushes with the law, hanging out with the wrong people. Um, and it was just hard. And then you get to an age as a, as a teenager that you realize we're different. Uh, you didn't really know that when you were five, six, maybe even seven, but you become a teenager and you're not wearing the uh, the Air Jordans to school and the other things. And, you know, that really started to hurt my confidence and and create a fire deep inside me that I don't know what it was going to look like or how it was going to look. But whenever 
I got to be of an age that I could make a change. I was going to make a change. I just didn't know what the path looked like. Yeah. Um, so it was really, really tough growing up because of the environment uh, that we were in. My parents were good people and did their best. Uh, but the 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 cards that they were dealt were pretty tough. Uh, was it just you and your brother? Just my brother and I. I have a two a brother that's two years older than me. Um, he took uh, he took the brunt of the hit, really. And I think it's because he was a little bit older, so he understood more. Mm. Um, and maybe you're listening, and you're the older sibling that was in that environment. You probably know what we're talking about. Um, not to say that I went through unscathed. Um, but there was a lot, you know, the bad, the bad situation led to infidelity. Um, you know, divorce alone is a tough thing. Um, even when everything else is great, but you compound divorce and then you compound drug abuse and then you compound poverty. Um, you know, one of my, one of my chores growing up was, uh, I had to cut squares out of 10 coffee cans and pop rivet them to the floor of my dad's car, um, mm. because it was so rusted out. And these are just glimpses into uh, poor. Um, and it's like, you can't even imagine that, you know, level of poor. I think when people hear we were poor, they were like, well, you didn't get to wear polo shirts. Yeah. Uh, there's a level of poor that gets to a very desolate place. Uh, because not only are you not getting a lot of money, but then you're mismanaging the money. Um, that's how poverty exists in America. Because if you manage the government assistance the right way, you're at least going to have a level of quality. But when you're not managing that little bit, yeah. um, it creates a catastrophic environment. And that's kind of where we were. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that and, and going into detail about it. How old were you when your parents passed away? So my mom was 48 when she passed. My dad made it to 57, I believe he was. So I was in my uh, 20s. Okay. Uh, I was. I think I was 26 when my mom passed and maybe 30. 35 uh, when my dad passed. So yeah, they both, uh, I, I mean, quite frankly, my mom outlived what anybody ever thought she would at 48 years old, 47 years old. Um, but they de definitely didn't see a normal lifespan uh, for sure. Uh, but it was the journey that was the most pressing, the most challenging you know, and as a child, like your parents are your heroes. Yeah. And so not only was there dysfunction, but you would constantly have to see your parents in pain. You know, I remember being taught by a, one of my mom's doctors once on how to care for her when she was having a seizure. Yeah. And um, I can't even count how many times I was home alone with my mom when it would happen. And if you ever have been around somebody that's had a seizure, it's a traumatic thing. Yeah. Uh, but when you're seven, and you're holding your mom and she's foaming at the mouth. And so there's not only like, this is hard, but there's also this mental yeah. trauma um, that sets in, fear sets in, because you're always just waiting for it to happen. And so you live in this constant state of anxiety all the time. Like we had to be caregivers. We had to be EMTs, literally uh, call 911 and here's what you do and hold your mom's tongue down so she doesn't bite it off. And yeah. We had to be, uh, we had to learn all these things. So we knew them, but then we had to anticipate. So literally, uh, I remember waking up some mornings as a kid thinking, I wonder if they're alive. Yeah. I wonder if they made it through the night. Um, and that just creates a lot of emotional distress to the point you're like, how am I ever going to get out of this? Yeah. That's exactly where I was going to go next. Were you resentful? Were you angry as a child? Oh, that's an understatement. The anger started to come out as a teenager. Um, because then I had freedom and I could do something about it. Um, I was very tempered more so than my brother, even cause I was, sure. I was mad at the world, yeah. you know, mad at God. How, if there was a God, how could he do this to us? How could he let this happen? Yeah. And, you know, that led to, you know, getting around misery loves company. We know that, yeah. uh, you become a product of the surroundings that you have. And so I just went and found a, a lot of other people that were dysfunctional and we kind of gelled and fit together. And that led to crime and you know, uh, kind of this gangster mentality of looking for the fight type yeah. people. Cause we were all just angry and upset with the world. And so, you know, what I learned in the journey, uh, because I'm on the show, not because it ended poorly, right. Um, I'm on the show because there is a good ending, but yeah. you know, these adversities and we all have them, they all come in all shapes, different sizes, but adversity in its essence can be a propeller or an anchor and yeah. we choose. 
And there was a long period of my life that I allowed it to be an anchor. Um, and I would justify my actions. You know, um, w- nobody wants to put their head on the pillow at night and be wrong. And so you just go out and live a life of dysfunction and put your head on the pillow and say, it's because of my upbringing. It's yeah. because of how I was treated. It's because I'm uneducated. It's because I grew up poor. And your mind is justified, but you're not making progress. You're anchored. Justified, I can sleep good because all the chaos and dysfunction, it's not my fault. It's not until we take ownership and we say, it's going to be different for me. It's going to be different tomorrow. It's going to be different for my kids. And we can let that fuel us to become a propellant. And uh, ultimately, uh, there was a you know, some defining moments that allowed that to happen. What was your parents' perspective on all this adversity growing up? You know, how, how did they, um, you know, they, they were dealing with their own conditions, but, you know, what were they passing on to you in terms of attitude and, and just overall life perspective as you were navigating all this? Yeah. I mean, my parents were good people, you know, they made bad decisions. So, I don't want to paint this picture like uh, they were monsters and horrible, like they were sure. good people. My dad, um, tremendous integrity. Uh, my mom, you know, she taught me what, um, how to fight well, what it looked like. You know, I would see her in so much pain all the time, um, surgery after surgery and remaining optimistic. You know, I, ha- I have shirts made that, um, that say attitude is a choice. Um, and I believe that. You know, you can choose, regardless of your circumstances, how you're going to respond. We can't always control what happens, but we can always control how we respond. And nobody on this earth has taught me that lesson more than my mom. And my dad, he taught me this level of resilience uh, because not only was he going through his own thing, but he also had a sick wife and two young boys that he had to care for. Yeah. And um, he taught me resilience and it came with challenge, of course. Yeah. Um, but he was present. Uh, my dad loved well. And so the things that uh, are the intangibles, um, and we know this in business and we know this in life, is that there comes a point in time in your life that, you know, the book smarts and all the other things aren't going to be enough to get you there. Um, integrity, value. And I prove this in my workshops when I ask leaders, what are the attributes you're looking for in the team that you build? And you hear things like character, trustworthy, uh, honest, hardworking. And never once when I ask this question, do I hear, I hope they can close sales well. I hope they're great negotiators. I hope they can navigate Excel spreadsheets. It never comes up. And the reality from that is, is the lesson of you will attract who you are, not what you want. And that was a lesson that I learned from my dad that I did carry into my adult life. Thank you for that insight. At at any point, you know, going through what you are going through, did you think that you were ever going to break the cycle yourself? I know you talked about it earlier. You mentioned, you know, not knowing if there was an end in sight. Uh, but to go from where you were to where you are today means that at some point you had to take ownership and you had to be really intentional about that ownership. Uh, but leading up to that moment where maybe you decided, I'm going to redirect my life, I'm kind of interested to get into your head around. Did you ever think prosperity was going to be in your future? Yes, but I didn't know what it meant. Um, And I know the exact place that I was when the seed was planted. And I was in third grade and I was at the local welfare office with my dad, uh, another trip to the welfare office to petition the state uh, for food stamps. Mm. And uh, I remember them telling him, Mr. Hancher, we've told you a million times. Um, the, the financial benefits you get are $400 more than what, um, would allow you to qualify for food stamps. And the food stamps benefits were like $3,000 a year. Mm. And he's like, can you just pay me $400 less in money so I can get to $3,000 in food stamps? And of course they said, that's not how the system works. Mm. And so my dad was my superhero, Superman. And I saw Superman crumble right before my eyes because his desperation turned to anger. Yeah, And anger turned to him being removed uh, from me uh, by security. Cops called the whole thing. And and for a, a moment in time, I'm pulled into custody. Mm. And I remember being separated from my dad. And I'm emotional. I'm crying. I'm in third grade. I'm a young boy. And it wasn't like, 
hey, someday I'm going to be very successful in a Fortune 500 company and this is all going to go away. Yeah. But what I did, that's the first moment that I can ever remember that the seed was planted of, I have to do something about this. There's something that I have to do. Well, when I became a teenager, it started to become a reality. I started my first business when I was 16. High dysfunction. Um, and I'm going to get very vulnerable with you. I started a flea market company. And um, I started going to auction houses and buying stuff and selling them three, four days a week at flea markets. Yeah. But I would run out of inventory. So what would I do? Anything anybody dysfunctional would do, go steal from people and sell their stuff. Mm. And so this was like, and how did I justify it? Well, I'm Robin Hood. Um, I, it's better in my hands. You have plenty. So I need what you have. And I had to come to this moment that like this dysfunction had to change. Yeah. I mean, I was making good money uh, compared to my standards. Yeah. But it but it wasn't until I went to the military that I realized, oh my gosh, there's a whole nother life. When I got out of small town America, got around more diverse people, more diverse thinking. Um, and then beyond the transition of the military, it was mentors that changed it completely, game over, full stop. I was fortunate enough that I had leaders and mentors around me that started drawing out the greatness that I didn't know yeah. was even there. And that's when the belief really started to happen that I might be onto something. Because my greatest hope in life was like, I'm going to transition from the military and I'm going to get into a, go a good coal mine or steel mill here in Southwestern PA, which isn't a bad living compared to where I came from. But I didn't have my sights set on where I was going because I couldn't even dream that big. We never actually touched on where were you geographically growing up? Southwestern Pennsylvania. Oh, no, so that, that's miles. where you grew up. You grew up in Southwestern PA. Yeah, right here. Got it. Got yep. it. Okay. Good to know. Um, let's talk about how you uh, ended up joining the army. Well, I'd love to tell you, Bashoy, that it was uh, the grand old flag and I'm <laughs> full of patriotism, although I am. Um, that's not why. Uh, literally, uh, I turned 18 on June 21st, so I'm a couple weeks out of graduating high school, and um, the walls were kind of getting, uh, they're caving in on me, um, hanging around the wrong people, brushes with the law. Um, I was running from something, not to something. There's a difference. Mm. And I remember passing by um, the recruiting station and just pulled in and was like, I'll just at least listen to what they have to say. Um, I couldn't really uh, afford to go to college, but I'm like, maybe they could help me. And so they told me about the GI Bill. And the next thing I knew, I was on my first ever plane ride to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, scared to death, white knuckled the whole way. I'd never been out of Claysville, Pennsylvania. Mm. Shout out to everybody in Claysville. Mm. I'd, I'd never been out of the tri-state. Vacation to me was going to Lake Erie for the weekend. Like this was a whole new world. But that's what led me to going to the military was... I was running from something, not to something. So I didn't even know what I was getting into, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and you brought up an interesting point about just kind of walking in as if you were looking for, you mentioned looking for something. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is discipline. And, mm -hmm. you know, something tells me that up until then, it was a lot of chaos and, and nearly no discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I kind of wonder, were you seeking out discipline, you know, subconsciously? Yeah, I mean, I was I was seeking structure yeah. probably more than discipline because, yep. you know, from a young age, I was my own man. Yep. And so um, I didn't really like to be told what to do so much so that I quit the high school basketball team because I was tired of the coach telling me what to do. I'm yeah. my own man. And literally, I would come and go when I wanted. I never had a curfew. Um, I was, uh, I matured fast, but what I did, what I knew I was looking for was structure. Now, look, the intimidation and uh, swagger of a drill sergeant will shape you up pretty quick. Um, and literally I, I truly mean this when I say it, the military transformed who I was Yeah, because I was able to shove off all that, um, ride or die mentality. I'll take the world myself. Um, I realized very, very quickly that uh, you don't defend freedom and you know build uh, you know build teams in the military by doing it yourself. Yeah, and so I got a, a, my first touch of that and real discipline. Yeah, um, at a real level, I, I got it there, which led to accountability, which were the hallmarks of who I've become. 
is people finding my blind spots, caring enough to say, this is, this is your, this is your opportunity. And this is the way to go about it. And I got my first real dose of that in the military. And then later on in, in my corporate career. You know, I'm sure you're not the only person. I'm sure there are many people out there with military backgrounds that came from more chaotic uh, beginnings, right? And Mm -hmm. we're going to skip around a little bit. But one of the things that kind of I'm thinking about is you've seen both ends of the spectrum, literally. You've seen the two extremes now from Mm -hmm. absolutely no structure to probably as structured and as buttoned up as it gets. And Mm -hmm. you've seen the pros and cons of both. And now you're a father. How do you approach this? Right. Like, you know, like you, you learned a lot from the earlier years you had in life and, you know, the times where you probably struggled the most. And then you saw the power of structure uh, and the benefits of that. So you kind of have, you know, both sides of the coin. Now that you're a father and you have two kids, um, and of course, you want the best for your kids. Um, h- how do you go about reconciling the two and making sure that perhaps they're not missing out on some of the lessons that you learned mm. in the midst of the chaos? Man, you are hitting a nerve. You are hitting a nerve. This I'm sure. Is, uh, I'm sure they call you out on it too at times. They do. Yeah. Uh, they do. You know, I remember. Um, I remember a day coming home and telling my son to take his Jordans off, and I, I threw them as far as I could into the pond. And and I know you're listening. You're like, this guy's a psychopath. You know, the one of my goals in life was to make sure that my son, when if he chose to play sports, that he would wear Jordan shoes. As shallow as that sounds, mm. like that was one of my goals in life. And this dude is wearing them outside in the rain and in the mud. And I'm thinking, man, if I ever had a pair of Jordans, they would be like cleaned every day, spotless up on the mantle. And this dude doesn't even care. And it wasn't until my wife reminded me of like his perception of Michael Jordan's shoes is much different than yours. And <clears throat> this is something as parents that we've tried to work very hard on. Uh, you know, when I met my wife, I was a secretary making $6 an hour. Mm. And so she's been on the journey the whole way, um, which is proof I'm a good salesperson because she married me at $6 an hour. But the reality is this, is like, I have thought about that because I have been able to give my kids a life that I could have only dreamed of. And so what I've worked really hard on is the intangibles Mm. Um, because, um, and and make, and trying to instill work ethic. They have a lot of luxuries um, that I didn't have, Uh, but they both had to do a one-year tour of duty at Chick-fil-A. Like Mm. that was a non-negotiable. You have to work one year at Chick-fil-A. Um, if you want help with college tuition, that has to happen. Um, my wife is a serial entrepreneur, so they would always have to work at the gyro shop or the donut shop or <clears throat> whatever it might be. So we have instilled that, but, but this, despite my best efforts, the, the adversity that was in my life that became a propeller, I can't give that to them. Yeah. I can't, no. I cannot give that to them. But the adversity that uh, causes a lot of people to let that become an anchor, they'll never know about it. They're never going to have to make the choice. But I will say, um, as dysfunctional as my journey has been, this um, I will I will die before I lose mentality came from a place of adversity and a, a place of healthy fear. Yeah. Um, if it's a 22-hour day, that's what it is. Um adversity created that mentality that has caused some dysfunction in my marriage um, and with my kids. So I can't give them that. So I've worked really hard to give them the other things, uh, the things that an employer won't be able to teach them. Uh, But I I find myself being very hard on people uh, because of how I'm wired. And I'm easy to chalk somebody up as lazy if they're not willing to work 30 hours in a row to make it happen. So I got to be very careful and have high emotional intelligence to realize that we all bring something different to the table. Um, and not everybody has the same backgrounds and it's finding that ebb and flow that has been my biggest challenge that I continue to work on to this day. That's a really important point that you bring up. You know, a lot of people who come from situations of adversity or having to overcome obstacles in life, you know, they have their perspective. And then that perspective Mm -hmm. was shaped by that adversity. And the Mm -hmm. amount of strength that was developed in those hard moments um, really kind of is 
at the core of everything that they do. Uh, mm-hmm. And at times, it's really easy to um, perhaps encounter someone who hasn't faced a similar adversity um, and question their perspective or their work ethic or their ability to handle certain situations. Um, and, you know, to your point, having that emotional intelligence is, is so critical uh, mm-hmm. in order to navigate personal and professional relationships. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate you touching on that. Um, yeah. I can, want, I, well, can I add one comment to yeah, that, please? Yes, absolutely. You know, as you as you were saying that, I was reflecting on like obviously the the audience is hearing my story, but we have also heard the story of somebody coming from uh, tremendous wealth and having all the luxuries of life and uh, being an absolute failure, um, depressed, um, mental instability because their parents were never around yeah. or they never had to learn how to work hard. My story is the other extreme. It's like, I didn't have anything, so I had to fight hard, but it led to dysfunction. You know what I think the common ground is as, as we're processing this? You have to own your own success. Um, we can't make excuses for um, how we grew up or what happened to us. Bad things happen. Um, good things happen. But at the end of the day, there has to come a turning point in our life that we say, I'm going to own my own success. Yeah. And you, everybody listening to this show, you fall in one of four camps. And camp one is, I hope it doesn't come up. Camp two is, if it comes up, I'll wing it. Camp three is, if it comes up, I'm ready to talk about it. And then there's camp four. And camp four is, if it doesn't come up, I'm bringing it up. Mm. When you're a camp four type person, you have taken ownership yeah. of your own journey. You've taken ownership of your own success. And at some point in time, I had to say to myself, I had to reflect back to third grade in the welfare office and say, I'm not going back. I'm not sure how to get to where I'm going, but I know that I'm not going back. And I know that if I have something to offer the world, then I'm going to be in a camp for position. Camp for people create wealth. They create influence. They create impact. But if you're not in camp four, you don't have anything to give. Yeah. So why don't we get into camp four more often? Because we're not willing to give up what we want now for what we want most, because it comes with a price tag yeah. and most people aren't willing to pay it. And I think whether it's my story or a complete opposite that leads to dysfunction, the message and the challenge and the encouragement I want to give everybody today is no matter what happened to you, you have to own your tomorrow and we have to move forward. There's a purpose that we have on this earth. We have to fulfill it. So well said. I mean, I couldn't have thought of a better way to put it. And 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 thank you, thank you for really painting it in the most black and white way. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of listeners are going to walk away from that. You know, probably listening to the last clip there and thinking he's absolutely right. Um, and we haven't even got into where life has taken you yet. Um, and so, why don't you give us a little bit of a walkthrough for what happened post? military and and where life took you there yeah um so i i transitioned from the military i got the gi bill i'm ready to cash in on it so i was going to go to a local university here i never wanted to be too far from my parents because they needed my my help um but i'm gonna go get this college degree and i'm gonna make a run at this thing like i'm gonna i'm gonna have new cars and the whole thing and um i'm two about two to three weeks away from starting at a local university here. And I got a call from my dad that I had gotten so many times, which was, uh, they're sending mom home in hospice. It's Mm -hmm. not looking good this time. And not that you get numb to that, but I've been down that road before. Um, the caveat this time, he said, Jeff, um, the reason I need your help is I have to have my leg amputated. He had severe infection from all the surgeries and all the osteoarthritis. So he's scheduled to have his leg amputated. Uh, My mom's being sent home in hospice. Uh, She had three quarters of her stomach removed. It it was, it was a dire situation. And he said, you know, your brother's off and already has his career started. I know you were planning to start college. Can you just put it off one semester? And of course, you know, I did what you would do and anybody listening would do is you put it on the back burner and uh, you take care of business. Well, As I'm trying to take care of my parents and get all the visiting nurses and all this stuff set up, uh, we finally got things stabilized and I didn't want to be a burden on them. So 
I'm going to show my age here. I literally went down to a newspaper kiosk and bought an actual newspaper Mm. and I took it to my parents' house and put it on the dining room table. And I was just looking for jobs that maybe I had any skill to do. Now let's keep in mind at this point, the only skill I had was effort. That was it. And I had that in truckloads, Um, but I didn't have skill. So I'm like, I got to find a job to where you can be a, a strong back grunt and I found one truck delivery. I'm like, I could deliver stuff. Like you don't need to have a PhD to do that. And so I applied to the job, had the interview, um, and was hired at Cintas corporation, other known as the uniform people as a fill in truck driver in September of 1996. Wow. And, um, the, the idea was just do this for a season, help my parents pay some bills quit the job truck driving and go back to school. Well, I stayed there 24 and a half years and went from a fill-in truck driver to a senior leader in that Fortune 500 company. And I'd love to tell you it's because I'm awesome. Um, That's not why. The why it all happened was I was around amazing leaders. I worked hard, of course. I developed skill. I fought to get into camp four, but I had leaders around me that really drew out the, the potential in me. And so I stayed stayed there for uh, 24 years and sales functions, operations functions, uh, global account functions. I mean, uh, you name it. I got to experience a lot of things uh, in that 24 year journey and created a life for my family that, you know, if I dwelled on it too long, I would get emotional thinking about it. Hey, all, it's me, Bishoy. As a marathon runner and endurance athlete, I've come to understand the importance of properly fueling your body for preparation and recovery. Every day you get a shot at success. How you start your day typically paints a picture of what the rest of the day will look like. Start your day with a super convenient, healthy, and delicious nutritional win. Meal one by Creatures of Habit. Overnight oatmeal packed with 30 grams of plant-based protein, chia, flax, and pumpkin seeds. Vitamin D3, omega-3s, a probiotic, and digestive enzymes made in under one minute. Stop wasting time or worrying about what to eat as your first meal of the day. Start with meal one. Visit creaturesofhabit.com, creatures spelled with a K, and use code MILE40 for 15% off a one-time purchase or the first subscription order payment. For someone who is admittedly not very coachable as a as a teenager and and someone growing up, it seems like you know you you went to the military, you embraced the fact that you were going to be transformed, and then you kind of took a shift to being extremely coachable. And the reason I say that is because one of the things that I'm picking up on, and this may have been just due to your circumstances, was you were looking for leadership. You know, I think oh, yeah. you were looking for for that guidance. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you mentioned earlier on in the podcast that when you were younger, there wasn't direction uh, as a byproduct of your circumstances. And then once you were given a little bit of direction, you know, it, it was crazy how dangerous you became with you know with some structure and, and direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, I would love to just get some quick you know, tidbit from you on the leadership that you encountered, um, you know, as you were navigating that journey and some of the things that stood out about it. Yeah. I mean, um, the journey early on was kind of embarrassing because there was so much I didn't know. Um, I didn't lose a lot. You know, I, I ran a successful business as a teenager. Um, I was a good athlete. Um, I was good on the rifle range in the military. Um, I had good physical training scores, but getting into corporate America, I got slapped in the mouth pretty quick. Um, there was a lot I didn't know. And I was a blue collar worker for the early part of my career. But, you know, I would always see these guys running around and girls running around dressed really nice. And they always drove nice cars and they always had the nicest, shiniest shoes I ever saw. And so I started inquiring, who are these people? What do they do? And I learned that they were salespeople. Now, look, I, I worked at flea markets for three years in my own business. I can sell anything. Yeah. And I remember applying for the job and bombing the interview and thinking, feeling defeat on the biggest stage at that time. Mm. And I remember um, being mentored 
uh, by a guy by the name of Joe Sable. Joe, I hope you get to hear this. Who really taught me not only how to be great at my job, but be, be preparing for the next one. And he was my service manager when I was a truck driver. So he pulled, he really poured in a lot of insight into how to be a professional. So that was the bedrock. Being in the military allowed my mind to receive the coaching and yeah. the mentoring. And then I got introduced to a guy by the name of Sean Coyne when I finally got my big break into sales. Um, what I found out early in my sales journey was that I sucked at it. Hmm. And uh, Sean put me on a performance improvement plan and he's like, listen, I really want to see you win. I think you're a good guy and you're one of the hardest working guys I've ever been around. I just don't think you're good at this. So he puts me on a performance improvement plan. And before I left his office, he said, Jeff, I could only see this working one way. You're going to need to do 125 cold calls a week in order to have any level of success. And when I mean cold call, I meant knock on the door cold call. Yeah. And I remember being so relieved. Like, why were you holding out? Why are you just now telling me this? And so away I went. And this is back to like, I'll do whatever it takes. I went out and did it. And slowly but surely, there was incremental progress. And because he saw my effort, he would start pulling me into the conference room and role playing with me and teaching me. And he would match my effort with his skill. And when the effort and the skill started to come into unison because he was willing to teach me the book, that's when success started to transcend. Um, and that's what propelled me into leadership. And uh, then, then the leadership mentoring was just bubbling all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, there are, there are definitely key people in this journey that I look back and I'm like, man, if it was not for them, there's no way. I, I mean, the little things like I didn't know what a caller stay was yeah. <laughs> and, and some of the sales reps would make fun of me. I didn't know that your belt and shoes were supposed to match. I had no idea. I had a leader once that literally um, my Christmas gift, he took me to Joseph A. Bank for a lesson on fashion and wow. bought me like $200 worth of, you know, shirts and ties and stuff and taught me how to tie a tie. Talk about leadership. Leadership. I mean, we're not talking about like hit your number, hit your quota. No, this week. no, yeah. We're talking about changing somebody's life. Literally, yeah. And that's why I'm so passionate about the subject because if it weren't for great leaders, I wouldn't be who I am. I would still have the poverty mentality. I would still have the, well, I mean, my first W2 at Cintas was 24,000 and I bought a brand new Chevy S10 truck <laughs> and I thought I arrived. Bashoy, I was telling my mom and dad, like, you guys are never going to have to cut uphill in half again to wait for the next prescription. I got this. I'm making 24K a year and I just bought a new car. No more cutting, no more cutting the coffee cans. We have arrived. 24K. But I had leaders that was like, no, there's more, man. There's so much more. You haven't even scratched the surface. I see your potential. You're moving up into sales. And 24,000 became 120,000 and 120,000 became another promotion. And they helped me mature into the blessing. Amazing. And that truly, if you think about it, the role of a leader is to help somebody reach their fullest potential. That's amazing. That's what was done for me. I, I want to give some context to the listeners just you know, because not everyone's going to be in the sales world. And I want to let them know, you know, Jeff was referring to being put on a performance improvement plan earlier. And generally speaking in the sales world, when you're being put on a performance improvement plan, the decisions kind of been made in the background that they're going to be letting you go. So he was pretty much on the edge of losing his job at that point. Uh, and, you know, you know, just getting that guidance, hearing the word, and then, you know, Acting upon it, obviously being the most important thing, um, and earning uh, that trust back, um, you know, as a true testimony uh, to to your journey. Mm -hmm. So, you navigated your way through. I'm sure we're not doing justice to the entire 24 years, uh, but we only have so much time. I get it. So, how did we ultimately go from you know climbing our way through the corporate arena? to now being on our own. Another defining moment. 
I was having a lunch with one of my best friends and uh, um, it was early 2019, January. It was right after the holidays. And he said, um, he said, you should really consider starting your own podcast. He's like, um, you have a gift that would help so many people in leadership. Mm. And I said, tell me more about this podcast thing. What is it? I had never listened to an episode. Fun fact, I have ne I never listened to an episode of a podcast until I listened to my own first episode. And he's like, listen, I'll help you out. I'll get it all set up. All you got to do is come into a microphone and say what you say. And I'm like, I love to serve people, Bishoy. So I'm like, if other people could benefit from mm. this, I'm in, let's do it. Mm. And so I started a podcast and um, it, it had a lot of early success. And so a friend of mine was like, you should have at least a Facebook page. I had never been on social media. This is 2019, by the yeah. way. I did LinkedIn for recruiting and sure. whatnot, but never on Facebook, never on Instagram and TikTok was like, no, no chance. I don't even think it was around then. But <laughs> um, so we started a Facebook page and people started DMing. Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you do this? And I started doing coaching and speaking on the weekends as a side hustle. Mm. And I started hearing the testimonials. And sometimes when I would do a keynote speech, I would see people in the audience uh, getting emotional, crying, and the stories that would come after that. And I'm like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. This is, I'm alive. I'm so fulfilled doing this. But I had an amazing job. I was in succession planning to become an executive, um, move to the, the, the corporate uh, office retire probably in my mid fifties, mm. late fifties and have just an amazing life. And why would anybody ever give that up? Especially yeah. somebody that came from poverty. You're going to look a gift horse right in the mouth. Yeah. You're going to walk away from the seven figure unvested stock portfolio and all this stuff and go out into a world that you know nothing about. And this tormented me. I was on a flight from uh, Atlanta on a Delta flight we weren't even at cruising altitude. We may be at, we're at 8,000 feet. And this, all this is going, uh, YOLO, jump off the cliff, the parachute, you know, the parachute will open. Yeah. Uh, you only live once. What's your legacy going to be? The other side was, what are you doing? You moron, you're going to throw it all away. What if this thing doesn't work? Yeah. I got so stressed out and so sick. I began to sweat. Um, I began to get sick in my stomach. I yeah. thought I might've been, I had all the signs of a heart attack. Mm. And so I got up because I thought I was going to get sick and I'm, I'm running down the aisle and I'm being screamed at, get back to your seat. I pass out. I have a seizure. Um, they, they threaten to land the plane. Um, I go to the emergency room. It's all stress related. And um, my wife, I remember sitting down with her and she was like, you need to stop stressing about this and do what you know to do. Mm. When She said these words, when I met you, you had nothing. And worst case is we go back to that same place and that's never going to happen. And she said these words to me. She said, when you're 85 years old and you, and you know, you're about to take your last breaths and you look back on this, what do you want your legacy to be? And we had this conversation about my obituary is not going to say he won nine president's clubs, was promoted 12 times. He was able to amass a wealth of X amount of dollars and had 15 cars in his parking lot. Bishoy, when I leave this world, I want people to be mad I'm gone. Mm. And I want people to be happy I was here. Mm. I can see it in your eyes right now, and I'm, I'm getting a little emotional just, just, just hearing it and just thinking about your wife uh, and the amount of confidence that she had in you um, and directing you to follow what you knew was right all along. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's extremely difficult as you're growing a family and as you're building a family um, and even in just a general partnership uh, yeah. to sometimes have to weigh out the sacrifices of making that decision. And yeah, so... That's... You know, it's not I, easy. It's not easy by any means. And yeah, you said a lot there, but one of the things that I think needs to be 
point it out is is your wife uh mm-hmm. and her role in directing you where your heart was and mm-hmm. uh, you know i could i could see it in your eyes again and i mm-hmm. i see it i i feel it um and so mm-hmm. yeah. um th- that that's that's just wonderful um mm-hmm. and and i'm i'm grateful that that's how it played out because yeah. th- that's just as important as all the success that came after that. That's probably more important. Yes. <laughs> than the, like we could end right there. And that's yes. probably more important than the success that came after that. Uh, yes. Because that is the takeaway here and the example uh, of um, how to level up your partner, how to support your partner, how to um, be in it uh, as a teammate. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and how to, um, build a foundation. And so everything there, it's huge, it's huge. It's huge. And I mean, the journey is not easy. I mean, I, I have not ever accomplished anything worthwhile that was easy. It is hard. And we talked about this earlier, like making that decision was hard. What are you giving up? And sometimes we focus so much on what could go wrong or what's been taken that we don't focus on what's left. I read this story once and it changed my perspective. I don't even know if it's a true story, but it doesn't matter. There's a story of of this guy, his name's Niccolo Paganini. And he's a 19th century um, expert violinist. And it, it talks about he's in an Italian opera house and he's playing in front of this amazing crowd. And, um, the packed house, people would pack this house, pack the house for this guy everywhere he went. And as he's playing, um, a string breaks on his violin, Mm. another string breaks, a third. A violin only has four strings. And three strings are dangling from this violin. And he finishes the song, but hadn't yet got to the encore. And so people started to exit out thinking there's no way that he's going to play an encore. He only has one string. And he turns around to the crowd and yells as loud as he can. Paganini will play with one string. And so he goes back and improvises beautifully a song mm-hmm. that, that brought so much emotion to this packed house. And he did it on one string. And this is a guy that was so good at what he did, he would have been well within his rights to just exit the stage. Nobody would have expected him to do it. Yeah. And what I learned from this story applies to all of us. Which is you can focus on the three broken strings or you can focus on the one that you have left. It's not ideal to have three broken strings, but it's also not ideal to give up. And there are people listening. I know it for a fact that have experienced pain, pain like I've had and different kind of pain. We know what it feels like to have pain. And there's also pain in getting to, the, to your goals and getting to what you want and the sacrifice. And if there's going to be pain, let's win. Let's choose to play the one string. Not ideal, but let's play it and let's give it our best. And the decision that I had to make having my wife with me, so much of that time was focused on what could go wrong. What what we I didn't focus as much on what could go right. That's why she was so instrumental in this and people that I care about and mentors saying, what if you do write the best-selling book? What if you are on the biggest stages? What if multitudes of lives are changed because of your story and your message and your your knowledge? What if that happens? And here was the answer. I would never know unless I tried. And so what I do know for sure is I'm not going to have any regret. That's a guarantee. I will not have any regret. And so far, so good. Uh, we're enjoying the ride, but we got a lot of work to do. Oh, man. I, I uh, That... That was so perfectly put, and I, I think that you know what I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to I'm going to joke a little bit. I am really excited for the clips that are going to come out of this episode because mm-hmm. you just keep nailing it here. Um, and um, you know, I, I know this isn't rehearsed. I know this is coming from the heart, and mm. and and it's as true as as it could be. Um, and I, I also keep thinking your kids are extremely lucky to have you. Um, mm. And I, I don't know if, um, you know, you approach fatherhood 
in a way where you realize that your parents did the best they could for you given the circumstances that they were under. But you know, given the circumstances that you now have, A, you're not taking anything for granted. But B, you know, you are going to put your best foot forward every day to be an example. Because as they say, kids watch what you do, not hear what you say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I feel like that is as true as it gets with you. Something tells me you're not just barking at them all day. You're, you're living it. You're walking the walk. Uh, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, I'm just thinking about how fortunate they are to have you. Yeah. And for the audience out there, he, he did recently have his kids, um, on one of his podcast episodes, which I tuned into and, uh, yeah, they, they sound like wonderful humans, man. They're amazing. They're amazing kids. And, you know, I don't know any dad or parent that's listening to this like, yeah, I did it so well. I did it so perfectly. Like there's no handbook for that stuff. And I think early on I was too hard on them because I just wanted them to be better than me and I wanted them to be their best. Um, but the one thing I've always tried to focus on was to love them well and to live my life. You nailed it. Um, you know, I, I've come I've come to realize in life that people see better than they hear um, and talks cheap talks cheap. That's why culture and companies is eroding. Um, because you know, we market it well and we poster it well, but, uh, people see better than they hear. And, uh, my wife and I have tried to really model that out, uh, not only to our kids, but to our community and, and now even the customers that we serve. Um, if I want my biggest competitive advantage in this space to be that I'm genuine and I truly want to see people win. I love that. Jeff, honestly, we could do a whole other episode because I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface um, on what it is that you're doing day in and day out. Uh, but I, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I want to ask you really quick, just kind of before we part ways here, where can people find you? It's Jeff Hancher, like Jolly Rancher, but it's with an H. Jeff Hancher, jeffhancher.com, Hancher Instagram, Jeff Hancher LinkedIn. Uh, if you Google me, you'll find me. Uh, the podcast is the Champion Forum podcast. It's geared towards the business professionals, specifically leaders. Um, and we talk a little bit of sales strategy and we try to get some uh, people a lot smarter than me on that show as well to uh, impart to others. So um, I just want to serve. So if I can serve in any way, um, you can find me and uh, we'll help any way that we can. Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, your authenticity, for opening up. I don't know that you go on too many podcasts sharing all this stuff. And uh, Mm -hmm. the fact that you opened up here on Mile 40 means everything to me. Mm -hmm. It means everything to our audience. Like I said, there are just so many takeaways from this episode. Thank you for the inspiration and thank you for the time. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing. Um, Literally changing the world, literally changing lives. And to be on this show and to follow in your footsteps of your journey, uh, you're not talking about it. You're being about it. And it means the world to me. And I really appreciate you having, having me on. It's a privilege. Thank you.